You'll notice too, people that are just getting into archery, you'll notice that when you first get your bow, you'll shoot lights out. It'll be the easiest thing you ever did and you'll love it. And then the more complex it gets, it seems like the harder it is to be really, really good at it. And I don't know if you're just kind of splitting hairs at some point where, you know, you're still shooting good, but you know, it's in your head more when you have one flyer. But. All right, what is up, everybody? I have Mr. Travis Dale Jones across from me. Now, Travis, he's he's a Vortex employee here. He's a friend of mine. He works downstairs in the consumer sales department. We're going to talk a little bit today about uh, bow setup, bow setup, compound bow setup. Now, this is a an interesting topic. It's a multifaceted topic. It's a topic where uh, you talk to any one person, they probably have a uh, a different way to skin that cat. Uh, and uh, I think there's some some baseline principles that uh, that hold true. I think that's what we're gonna we're gonna stick to today, kind of kind of the more baseline principles, high level, what's going into a bow setup, kind of bow setup basics. And we might even have like, I don't know, down the road we might have uh, deeper dives into this. So let us know if you want a deeper dive into this at, at the end of this one. And we might even talk to multiple people about the same thing because, I've talked to people at different bow shops, people at different people here at Vortex. There's all sorts of different philosophies when it comes to properly, quotation mark, properly setting up a compound bow. One of the people we're going to talk to, Mr. Travis Dale Jones. Travis, I'm sorry. I, you told me your middle name like five minutes ago, and I just, I like it. <laughs> it's got a good ring to it. Yeah, there you go. Um, everybody yeah. everybody likes Dale. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know any Dale. Well, my grandfather, I guess, was Dale, but... That's about it. What? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about yourself. What you do here at Vortex. Uh, your passions. Your hobbies. A little bit about your 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 bow setup background. Sure. Yeah. So um, Travis Jones. Travis Dale Jones. Uh, <laughs> officially. Officially. Yeah. Uh, I'm in consumer sales uh, down there, um, answering the phones. A lot of times you guys call in. I'm the guy to talk to along with everybody else down there. Um, I work uh, with Ryan, which is an honor, obviously. Um, that's always nice to see his face every day. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you have any questions on stuff, uh, we're usually the guys to answer it. We answer the emails and chats and everything else, and we handle individual sales and, and uh, that part of it, too. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a big change from where I came from. Um, I did line clearance for 12 years, uh, trimming for the power lines. Um, I've done construction. Uh, I worked for Stam Construction, doing building pull sheds for a while. Um, I was in the tire industry for a while, changing tires. Uh, welding is actually what I initially started out of high school. Um, I started right away with a passion on welding, got really good at it, and then of course I was gonna uh, go to the Navy and be an underwater welder, and and uh, I ended up um, just we're trying to sign up and my mother was not too crazy about me going to the Navy. So, um, she, uh, she didn't like that idea. And actually when I graduated, I was only 17. So you needed consent from both parents, um, when that happened. So then that quickly rerouted to, she wouldn't sign you away, huh? No, she didn't. She didn't like that. Um, which obviously uh, now having a daughter of my own, I can see obviously her worry, but, um, it makes sense there. But, uh, yeah, uh, I ended up getting into welding. Um, uh, did worked for a few companies doing building some stuff with doing metal fabrication and that kind of thing. Um, then it escalated and everything else. Um, I like to tinker. I like to change what I'm doing. Um, I don't want to say I get bored doing something, but once I do something and I figure it out, um, I tend to, my wa mind wanders onto something else that I can then dive deep into. I love learning. I love reading about stuff and I can sit and read for hours. Um, so that's kind of my passion. And um, as far as hunting, gosh, uh, my dad's been taking me hunting since I was three years old. He took me out on coon hunting and deer hunting, and um, they used to laugh because of the, the corn, corn after they'd combine the corn, the corn was too tall for me to walk through, so they'd have to carry me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so hunting and being outdoors and all of that, is, that's been in my blood for, you know, forever. Um, I grew up in the country, so, you know, it, I was always accessible. Like, that's what we did. We rode our bikes down to go fishing, or we rode our bikes out to go hunting or shooting, you know, our, our pellet guns or whatever else. But um, so that's kind of where I, where I came from. I was, I was probably, oh, I would say I was 12, I think. I had just started to be able to uh, carry a, a firearm on my own. 
mm-hmm. um, and actually start hunting. Um, so I was somewhere in that 12 to 14 range when I was introduced um, by my uncle, uh, the uh, a archery side of it. And of course, with my love of just hunting in general, it was, it was like, man, I can do this longer? You know, that's a great idea. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, we got months of hunting versus yeah. like, you know, nine days? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that's probably the biggest advocate for people to get into archery is because it extends your, you know, your season. But, uh, um, but yeah, so he set up a bow for me. I think it was just like an old uh, Fred Bear compound. Um, squeaked when you drew it back, made a lot of weird noises. That's how you know it's working. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, there wasn't a, there wasn't a big process then. Um, but that's, that's back in days when things were much simpler. Um, and he just had me, he had me come up and shoot bow in his backyard to get, you know, sighted in and get shooting. And then, um, we had some timber right behind his house that we could hunt. And the very first night he set me out there, um, I ended up shooting two doe. <laughs> oh my so, gosh. Yeah. I shot two doe in the same night and I was ecstatic. It was actually, there were, there were like, uh, it was a, a doe and, and two fawn. Um, and I, I ended up taking two of them and I was, I was ecstatic. I was so excited. Um, so that was, that was really, that's a hell of a first day. That was a special moment. Yeah. And obviously it changed from there. It wasn't that easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, right. Um, but I, I shot, uh, I shot, uh, fairly large deer with a bow, um, being my first buck, um, antlered deer, um, was with a bow and then my passion for the archery thing. I didn't have a whole lot of teachers or anybody to show me the ropes, you know, so Mm -hmm. I kind of just had to figure it out. Um, my uncle had kind of got me into it, but, um, from there I was just kind of like, okay, you know, off little young one and archery. So, um, that was still back in the days of shooting like aluminums and stuff, but, um, things changed quite a bit since then oh yeah archery has came a long way um mainly i think on the on the accuracy and the technology and just everything you know has has really come a long way but yeah so that's kind of my background and um i love archery hunting i uh my wife and i we are huge western hunters we love elk hunting we love mule deer hunting and being out in the mountains we shed hunt every year we spend a lot of time out there so um, and it's always, not always been, but primarily it's been archery. Um, but of course, you know, the same thing out there is going out with a rifle, then it just extends your, your season. It's a little different for us going, us as in Midwesterners going out West, you know, you think it's not like just grabbing a tag and going hunting in your backyard. It's, uh, now you have to draw for States or, you know, that your options are a little bit more limited. So being open to take any weapon available, you know, in a season and just run with it, that's. You know, that's important to, for the opportunities. But. For sure, for sure. You mentioned a couple things there. The welding, uh, Jim, who I commonly uh, co-host the podcast with, big welder now. Yeah, yeah. Has I, he talked to you about that at all? No, but I heard you made a comment that he welded it. Uh, that he weld up his own flatbed. Yeah, or a whole box. Was it a box or a flatbed? No, it's a flatbed. Yeah, it's that's amazing. Awesome. Like it looks all pr- the welds are just like beautiful. Like everything. Like, uh, you know, if I was to do it, it'd look like some sort of like grade school <laughs> art project, you know, like, oh yeah, no, the right's supposed to be higher than the left. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all about, oh, you don't appreciate good art. Um, it's amazing. It looks like something you would have like purchased from like a flatbed cool. thing. And he, he welded up, uh, this other like crazy, like, um, light stand, like wheeled light stand thing. So he can like work on his cars, like, but have like this remote mobile light system to yeah. add light, which actually removes my only job of working <laughs> on a vehicle, which is holding, <laughs> holding the light. light. Uh, yeah. yeah. Big welder now loves welding. Can't That's get awesome. enough welding. That's awesome. You said yeah. another thing too. You say you, you love to learn and you are a tinker, mm-hmm. which I feel like if you're into working on bows or, or working on your own bow and have the uh, the desire and confidence to, to touch this thing, you got to be a tinker. Yeah. Like a lot of archery yep. folks are big time, tink- always tinkering. Yep. 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 Dan, Dan Staten at Elk Shape, actually. That's it. <laughs> always be tinkering. He, yeah, man. He has been pumping out the podcast on, on his bow setups and stuff. And he loves just diving into that like full bore. That's cool to see. It's just his, you know, his... Uh, you know, for him to be just so about it, that's that's good. It's a good thing to do because obviously it's going to make you a better, 
you know, bow shooter as well. Mm -hmm. So different than rifles, you know, there's guys that just pick up a rifle and go hunting. And then there's guys that reload their own bullets and build their own rifles and Mm -hmm. all that. The the deeper you go, obviously the better, um, you know, you are with the equipment. Look, the same thing with Jim too. Sorry. I mean, like Jim, you know, in his cars, you know, there's a person that literally just uses it to get to work every day. And then there's people and I actually, so I went to WyoTech and stuff for diesel mechanic and so there's other parts of me too. And, uh, <laughs> is that in, is that in Laramie? Where's yeah, that at? Laramie, Wyoming. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Spent some time out there. Yeah, I like Laramie. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, um, but cars too. You know, obviously there's there's rabbit holes and tinkering that you can get into, and it always makes you more efficient. Obviously, I I can probably imagine that Jim is probably pretty good with a with a steering wheel. Oh, he's just um, smart too. Like yeah. I mean, like I'm not even blown. Like he's a smart kid. You know. I see what you did there. That was good. That was yeah. good. Jim, I, are you listening? <laughs> Jim, are you listening? No, but yeah, anytime you, anytime you, uh, dive deep into stuff and really learn about every single piece of it, it's always going to make you better at it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I think that's where, you know, a lot of folks get, uh, with, you know, at least, you know, speaking specifically to the archery side of things like Dan, Dan, I think he like got to a point where he's like, you know what, like I want to be able to do this myself. Um, which is kind of like a tricky thing because there's, there's some risk there too. You yep. know, I mean, like when I get my bow set up, I'm like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, don't breathe on it. Right. You know, uh, but also like there's a, um, with a lot of things like, like the self-sufficiency thing. Like, I mean, I love my local bow shops. They're amazing. They do an awesome job. They know, they know what they're doing. Right. But that can be tricky too, because you're not always, you don't always have that or you don't have the time to get there. Um, and I think also it's just good to have like a basic understanding, which I'm, you know, probably scratching the surface of, of like, what's going on with this thing, mm-hmm. right? Like, even even if you're going to take your, your bow to a bow shop, like, it's kind of good, a good idea to have, like, a baseline knowledge of, like, so what are they doing, a little bit of what are they doing and why, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and and maybe with that, you know, along the way, maybe, maybe eventually, you know, you do, you do take on some of that stuff yeah. yourself. When did, when did you start working on your own bow, Travis? Honestly, like, right away. I mean, like I said, I didn't have... You couldn't wait to tinker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, I think that's been me since I was since forever but um but i think it was more or less like like we talked about like you know you have a bow shop and you take it to the bow shop and they set it up and then you're home well it's we lived in an, out in the country so it wasn't like you know oh my bow is doing something funny let's run down to the shop here and, and see what's going on it was something where you had to plan for it and i didn't like to wait so i was like well i'm gonna figure out how this stuff works so then i can you know make it better it was probably more or less not so much I'm going to figure out how this works so I can make it better. It's probably, it's not doing what I want it to do. So I'm going to try to make it do what I want it to do. So <laughs> that's, that pushed in. And that was, that's not what you want to do. <laughs> um, that is kind of, you know, when I was young, you know, like a young kid, that's kind of my mentality on it and trying to learn how to do that. But you no, know, like to touch on something you were talking about, being able to adjust a lot of this stuff is really good for, especially Midwesterners going out West hunting, you know, that travel, you, something happens to your bow. You need to know, cause a lot of times out there, um, you know, the bow shop may be miles and my, I mean, you know, hours, from miles, me. hours, may, whatever. Yeah, you, yeah. May, you may lose a day. You know, we actually, small story. My wife, we were in the mountains in Idaho, um, got on a herd of elk and we had bulls screaming all around us and, um, bull came in right up the hill, right at her. And when she shot, it was just a loud bang. And it sounded like a 22 going off. And I thought, what in the heck? Did she shoot a tree or what? And I walked up, you know, because I was calling out the back. And I come running up. And I'm like, what's going on? And she's just like this. And her arrow, basically what happened is um, her knock, when she drew back, it pulled out just just enough that it stayed on there. So when she shot, it was basically like dry firing her bow. The arrow just flopped to the side, bullet six yards standing right there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And uh, so what happened was is it, it flung her peep out. So oh. peep was gone. Now that's not something that, you know, usually you can do because you really, you need a press to, to do a peep, but you can make shift with some bungee cords and stuff like that. But we had to drive like an hour and a half, um, down to a shop in Afton, Wyoming. The guy, we called him, my wife asked him and he's like, yeah, but I'm closing up here soon. He stayed late for us to get there to tie in a peep and got everything. And that was, I mean, kudos to him if he's ever listening. I mean, that guy is, he's a true gentleman, but um, that's, that's some things that you can't fix in the field, but there are, there are other things that if you get there and your stuff is out of whack and it's shooting way crazy, you know, you have the knowledge to fix it and get it back into tune because I can tell you right now that, you know, there's in shooting in general, I would say, you know, most of it is 
confidence in your equipment because I'm sure you know that first time that your your bow or your rifle shoots off or shoots funny all of a sudden you're just like whoa what's going on and then you just can't figure it out and it's usually never good it's the same thing when you shoot 3d the one time you shoot that one arrow and it just totally goes off and you miss a target or you hit way back or something like that it's like you just it's hard to catch back up with that because you start to get frustrated and then everything else but in a hunting situation we want to make sure that our stuff is dialed you know Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, like, if you're like step one, like, okay, let's say you got, you got a new bow, bare bow, right? What, like, what, I guess, what does your process look like when you're setting that thing up? Well, purchasing a new bow, obviously brand new right off. It's going to come bare. Um, it's not going to have any of this stuff on it. Um, as far as which one you purchase, they're all great. They really are. Um, I'm not really brand loyal to anything. Um, it's kind of just like if, if I like, like it in the moment that I'm in a you know, market for a new bow, I purchase it. But first thing you're going to have to do is you'll notice that they'll have a, a little string in your, uh, a little tiny string in your string where they'll, they'll have to set up a peep sight. So in order for you to even shoot this bow, we need a peep sight. We need a D loop, which is where our release hooks to. Mm-hmm. We need a rest, which is on the bottom of this for people who are watching this on YouTube. Um, there's a rest on the bottom and there's a, a sight up here on top. Now that's kind of your main fundamentals. Um, there is um, your arrow uh, quiver up here for holding your arrows, but that's kind of not, you know, essential to actually shooting shooting the bow. We need something to hold hold the arrow to tell us where we're sighting with in conjunction to on the string, um, that peep sight, and then the D loop token on there. You will have to buy a release. There's multiple releases. Um, obviously, there's wrist slings. There's thumb releases. Um, there's back tension, there's a hinge, there's uh, true back tension. There's a lot of different ways you can go there. Um, just get something simple. Don't make it complex when you start. Um, that's probably, you'll notice too, people that are just getting into archery, you'll notice that when you first get your bow, you'll shoot lights out. It'll be the easiest thing you ever did and you'll love it. And then the more complex it gets, it seems like the harder it is to be really, really good at it. And I don't know if you're just kind of splitting hairs at some point where, you know, you're still shooting good, but you know, it gets in your head more when, when you have one flyer, but, um, yeah, so that's where, where we'd start. So if I bought one and you're at, you know, you have a bow, your first thing you're going to do is you got to find your center, your center point for your arrow. Um, now, uh, they will come with either, I don't know if this one, this looks like it was served in here. Um, this is a, a friend of ours, bow, a coworker of ours down here, Taylor Myers bow. So, um, Taylor's good for decking out everything he has. So that's good for this podcast because we'll be able to look at everything. But um, usually there'll be a um, a knock pinched on your string that'll give you your center point. So you'll set your arrow there. That way we don't, we're not searching for that here. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, we will install our, our rest on the bottom here. You'll adjust your rest so that your arrows, to put it really simply, uh, we want that arrow to come perfectly straight. You know, uh, whether that's up and down or left and right, as long as you are perfectly in the center of this string, you know, because mm-hmm. this is a system, they both have to work together. Uh, they pull back straight, got, it has to go forward straight. Um, so as long as that arrow is perfectly straight with your string in the direction that it's traveling, then we're good. Um, you'll have systems like on uh, recurve bows, long bows, where, you know, now you have to induce archer's paradox. We need that that arrow to come around and come back because we don't have a center shot um with compounds today you'll see that the riser is notched out so that we're trying to get that arrow to just go straight Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's the first two steps is obviously tying in this d loop now these are a cow hitch they're a good that's a good knot um or barrel i think barrel a barrel hitch or a cow hitch um either one of those will, will work for a for a d loop if you're at the the bow shop they'll probably do it for you um one small little thing is I did notice that this D loop is like an inch long. So he could, he could change. I know maybe sometimes you need that, but, um, usually like if it's a guy that's got a super long draw length, so there's not every bow out there that offers like a 32 inch draw. Um, so you can actually kind of, Oh, kind of cheat that a yep, little bit. Yeah. You can give yourself a little bit longer. So, cause, uh, your form is important. So if you're just like setting up a, you know, a rifle scope on a, on a rifle, um, we want to set the optic in the rifle to you, not vice versa. So um, it's important to make sure that your draw and everything is really, really good and solid. So you can kind of cheat that there. But um, these do break. This is a maintenance thing. Keep an eye on it. Um, I've had them break. That's where you punch yourself in the face. It sucks. Um, I think 
anybody's been shooting long enough, they've had one break on them, unless they're just, you know, good at pre maintenance and have them um, swapped out regularly. This one doesn't look too bad though. Starting to get some wear in there, but no, it looks good. And I'd say yeah. that. I mean, that's going to be considerable number of shots. Oh yes. You know, yeah. un- unless you know something else happened to yep. it. You know, but yep. um, honestly, you'll probably change your string out, and at that time, just have them tie a new D loop on there, and then you don't have to worry about it. Changing your strings out is actually a good thing to do, too, quite often. You know, as far as, um, and, I, and I guess I can't uh, uh, concretely say this was the case. So I recently set up a new bow. I love it. So it's, uh, uh, I'm living that carbon life I have for the last few years. Uh, it's a Hoyt RX-7. I don't have it in front of me right now. but um, I love those. But so my... Uh, couple guys I know who are like very very experienced archers are like and I just I didn't have the time but they're like get a get your rest on there get your d loop on there and just put you know at least a couple hundred arrows through it to get it just like you know to you know stretch the string a little bit get the bow settled in and I didn't do that I'm like ah, I'm pressed for time I got a hunt coming up um I'm just gonna get it set up I've done this before like I've done it that way before it worked fine and I actually, like like I said, I can't, like, 100% point to that, but I was chasing my tail for a little bit as far as, you know, set up this and set up that and um, yep. until I finally got it, and it was just like, pew, 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 like, like, I was like, I finally got to a point where I was, like, really, really confident in the, in the way the bow was set up and sure. really, really confident in the way the bow was shooting. But I'll say before I got there, though, and you mentioned this, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, like, I was in my own head. Yep. And like, that's just like, you can get into not a good mental space trying to ferret out like, Mm -hmm. you know, what is it? What is it? Something is, is it my, is it the bow? Is Mm -hmm. it the way the rest is set up? Is it this? Is it that? Is it my grip? Is this just a me issue? You know? And then, you know, there's so many different variables at play. It can be difficult to, uh, you know, narrow it down and figure it out. And, and it's probably a lot of things at once, too. It's, it kind of, is. You know, it's multiple things at one time. Yep. Yeah, you'll start to, I mean, it was a, probably a combination of a lot of things from one. Obviously, anybody that shoots a, a, a new bow, you buy a new bow, it feels a little different when you get it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, us as the shooter, we're the main part of everything that happens, you know, with it. So it's a lot of you getting, you know, used to that. Um, it's also like string stretch. So Mm -hmm. I think they used to a lot worse than they do now. I think string technologies have came a long way. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, let's say 10 years ago, uh, trying to think probably even longer than that and dating myself here. That's, that's pretty, that's not that long ago. Um, you know, 10, 10 to 15 years ago, I think there was definitely a break in on strings that was very important. And I think there still is, Mm -hmm. they are going to stretch a little bit. You'll notice, um, your D loop. So when they first tie it, when a brand new bow or a new set of strings, and then you start to shoot it after that first 100 to 200 shots, mm-hmm. you'll notice that D loop starting to, to turn to the side. And then you'll notice that your peep doesn't line up with your eye. That's just your string settling in. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is common. Obviously, I, like I said, uh, string technologies have, have come a long way. And I think they're starting to mitigate most of that. But you will still get just the, the string settling in there. But knots, obviously the knots settling in and everything yep. like that. But proper draw length key yeah so you know, that's probably step one actually you know so yep. if you're if you're th- if you're thinking about getting a new bow or you're like oh, i'll buy a bow off my buddy or something like that uh you definitely want to make sure that it can get that it can be at least adjusted to a draw length that matches your build yep yeah so some bows some bows are you have to change out mods on the cam um, there's like a, this, this part of where their cables sit. So yeah, explain what a mod is. So the mod, um, they'll call it a mod. It's part of the, the cam system. Um, the mod is controlling a couple things. Well, it, it's where your, um, it sets a lot in your draw cycle, but, um, the mod is going to change where your, um, the draw cycle of the bow. Um, so you, some of them are adjustable. Like you see on this one here, I would say most of them are adjustable these days. Yeah. Hoyt likes to hold on to that, uh, needing, needing a, a draw or a, a mod to, to be able to switch out your your cams but um, most companies are going to be adjustable and you'll see there's little pins that you can change where all these are that's going to change um, it changes a lot of things but it, it's going to change basically where that that draw stops so 
Um, and then there's multiple things. You can't just start pulling this stuff apart. Some of them are, some of them are easily adjustable, but most of them you're going to need a press. Um, take it to the bow shop and have them do it. That'll make sure that you're in the right spot because, um, you know, that's going to change your timing of everything. Um, but as far as stick, stick with draw, draw length. So as far as your draw length, there is a calculation that you can do to get basically what you think you need. Um, but as far as it's, it's changed a lot in the last, you know, 20 years, I would say it started as, you know, you need, I think it started more like a straight arm and then it went to, no, we got to buckle that arm. Then it, now it's starting to float back out to, no, you want to make sure you have a nice solid, you know, arm length out. Now all that's obviously going to change your draw length. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of, it's went a lot of different ways there, but I would find a happy medium. You don't want to lock your arm out because that's a good way to get yourself a nice little bruise across your forearm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, proper draw length is going to come down to a you know an archery shop setting you up um they'll measure you know for you and and they'll set it up that way but yeah i think the calculation is like it's like it's essentially, it's essentially like your wingspan yep. like your middle finger to like the tips of your middle fingers yep and then uh what did i wrote it actually down here and then divide that number by 2.5. Yep. And that, so that's going to get you, that's going to get you, you know, basically your draw length, but everybody's just form is going to be slightly different. Their, their joints going to be different. There's some people over there, you know, their elbows lock out mm -hmm. um, and then feel too. Um, you can kind of like, if a, if a, a longer draw length is going to be harder to pull over that cycle, if you got a hard draw cycle. So, um, if you had a shorter, slightly shorter draw length, you're going to be able to pull, and that it's going to change your poundage. You can just probably better to change your poundage than it is to change your draw length. But mm -hmm. like I know, I can pro I can shoot a 29 inch bow, um, but it's it just it feels a little funny and it's a little bit stretched out. Now if I lock my arm out and I'm fully back and I got you know I can get a good anchor and shoot it, but 28 just feels really good to me. Um, that gives me a little bit of leeway, you know, mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. that there. And there's some that they're like half inch adjustable and, you know, you can really fine tune them to exactly you. But um, it's, it's important to, you know, when you first start, because I've, I've seen a lot of bows set up way too short where they got an arm back here and some, mm -hmm. some that you can tell are way too long and they're really overextending out here and they don't have a good anchor point. So that's really going to affect, you know, obviously your accuracy and, and your shooting and bad habits are hard to get rid of. So, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that's all set up the first time, um, is really, really good. It's really, really key. Yeah. And, and a, a good bow shop is going to help you with that. You yep. know what I mean? They're going to be able to take that measurement and then get you set up and yep. kind of fine tune from there. Um, hopefully yep. help you, you know, and this is, you know, speaking more towards, well, you know what, I'd, I was going to say a new archer, but hell, like I went, when I went to the bow shop this year, great guys took some time with me. They're like, eh, let's work on that grip a little bit, yeah. you know, and it made, it made me a better shooter. Yeah. It made me a better, more consistent shooter, yep. which again, goes right into that whole confidence thing, being repeatable. Like you want your equipment to be p repeatable, but you need to be repeatable too, Absolutely. you know, and, and also repeatable like in, in the moment of truth, which mm -hmm. is, you know, That's hard part. to do when basically, you know, everything is just, you know, there's a lot going on there. Yep. There's a lot going on yep. there. Um, they set up your draw length. Now, poundage, obviously, are adjustable. Um, you can get anything from 20-pound bows all the way. A lot of them are going to have a, um, you know, a, a set distance or a set variance that you can set it at from, let's say, 60 to 70 pounds. Some are in between there. Uh, some are really, really wide. If, if you're first getting into archery, um, you probably don't have the muscles set up, you know, to, to properly draw and stuff like that. So, um, you'll see with like, um, new archer, new bows, uh, youth bows and women's, uh, bows, they'll have a really long draw length or, uh, draw weight adjustment, you know, mm -hmm. for anything down to 30 pounds up to 70 pounds. Um, and those are good to start with cause then you can really work up to and see where your max is. Um, I've, I've ran everything Draw with the bow a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've shot up to 80, I actually had a Bowtech one time that uh, we were pretty sure it was like 96 pounds. I think that's what it was. It oh was crazy. Gosh. Yeah, there were supposed to be 80, 80 pound limbs, but um, for some reason they were drawing super, super hard, which usually that would be in the tuning. So we took it to a bow shop and we went through everything. We're like, everything's right. There's just, these limb, limbs are just super stiff. So um, it was probably something in the limbs, but... So you were drawing cool. 92 pounds? I, I couldn't pull it back fully drawn. And that's where I was like, I know I can draw 80 pounds. Like, I've drawn 80 pounds. 
and I couldn't draw back. My buddy, who's really big dude, he goes up there and you know he cranks her back and he's like, "Holy cow, you know that's that's crazy." And then we put it on scale and it was super, super heavy. But uh, no, we backed that down. I used to shoot. That was a Bowtech Invasion. That was a really good bow. Um, with uh, I think I had it set. I finally set it at like seventy-seven pounds. And you know, you know, get people to say you don't. Obviously, you don't need eighty pounds to to kill something. You don't. I had an eighty-pound Hoyt RX six RX five. I think I can't remember now. Um, one of the carbons, very nice bow. Um, probably the most, one of the most forgiving bows I've ever shot. They just always shot really well, you know. I had a carbon spider that I still have because I could not force myself to get rid of it. Like, yeah. like I'm, I'm really, really digging this RX seven, and I think I had an RX three before that, which I guess I liked them all. I like those bows. Yep. But like, as far as like getting set up, that for whatever reason. And I, I don't have, you know, I can't put my stamp on what it was. Mm-hmm. Dude, I left the shop with that thing, and it was like, dude, it ate any broadhead, any this, any, like, that was yeah. like, uh, it was just like, that, like you said, for forgiving, like, it was just like, it just, like, didn't care. Yeah. It was it was nice. Yeah, um, yeah. If, if you find a bow that's like that, don't give it up. <laughs> Cause right. The next one probably won't be, and then you'll be, like you said, chasing your tail, and you're just upset that it doesn't shoot as well as the last one. But, yeah, it, Good. those certain bows every once in a while you'll come across one that just shoots so good no matter what you do to it no matter what you throw through it but kind of like a fine rifle but um as far as setting up here but we get our draw length set up um, we get our poundage set up um they're gonna you have to install a rest so our rest is going to basically hold the arrow up so mm-hmm. multiple different kinds of rests there are um like a stationary rest that just holds it like a whisker biscuit mm-hmm. um there are uh, drop away rest now drop away rest is basically as soon as you fire that bow that is going to release because we don't need the inertia of the of the arrow is going to hold it in place so you don't need a rest holding it there anymore um there are like fully caged type like we see here with this hamski um there are completely open like a uh, like a uh, target style you'll mm-hmm. see there's there's different little um uh, little flapper dealies here they'll be really wide you know more of a hunter series where you're not worried about that arrow moving and then you'll see the target ones are just like a really little look like look at a like a snake tongue i was gonna say i think a lot of them are called like a lizard tongue yeah yeah you know which yeah um i'd say most commonly on hunting compounds i see today people are running on some sort of drop away or you do see a lot of a lot of whisker yeah i shot a whisker biscuit for a couple of years um i feel the it uh i feel like that rest like it's full capture mm-hmm. like i mean it's got the whiskers going all the way around it yep. i feel like it defies everything like i feel like it goes against like everything that i would think needs to happen for an arrow to fly yeah, true it does and yet they work pretty damn good yeah yeah they eat up uh fletchings kind of uh you'll notice that your there's some downsides up, but yeah yeah they just they just work, you know, and as far as a beginner setup, shoot a whisker biscuit. If you don't want to get into, you know, dealing with a drop away, because there's a lot that goes into drop ways, um, a whisker biscuit is great. I shot it for many, many years when I first started, and um, like we talked about earlier, I shot, you know, a lot of deer with a whisker biscuit, and it never gave me any issues. But There's definitely uh, a practicality about it that is undeniable. Sure. Um, but... Yep. I def, you know, o- over time though, like I do prefer, I do prefer a drop away though. Like yeah. if you, if like, if you're going to make me pick one, you know. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. For, for fine tuning and actually having a nice, nice, fine, accurate, uh, setup, you, you definitely want to run a drop away. Um, there's two different kinds of drop aways. There's limb driven and cable driven. Um, a limb driven is they're like reverse of each other. Uh, limb driven is basically when you draw the bow, um, it's bringing it up where, uh, from your limb pulling on it. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, cable driven is when you pull the cable is what's going to, you know, pull it all the way up to a spot and then they snap forward. The limb driven is actually your limbs are what's pulling it down. Um, so the other ones are basically just on a spring. So the spring is what's forcing that down. Sometimes that spring can get weak over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you'll start getting fletching contact, um, which out of nowhere, all of a sudden you'll start having arrows flying funny and you won't know. Um, keep an eye on those fletchings that's why i like bright fletchings because well, for multiple reasons but one you can see that contact um but then where the limb drivens are really really nice and i know dan is a big fan of the limb driven so i think for multiple reasons but um that limb there's no failing point there that limb is what's actually slamming that that rest down getting it right. out of there 
um, which is really, really nice. And you, there's there's no worry of it ever, that spring wearing out. Or, um, there's there's physically no way other than it just failing, right, breaking your string. Um, but there's no way for that not to pull that out of there before that arrow, before that fletching gets there because those cams, you know, are well past, you know, where it has to go to, to pull it down there. So they're a really good system, the, the limb driven. Some people are worried about the string. Uh, they don't like that it has this string on the side. Um, I have never actually ran one. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there was a topic that was brought up, um, with Dan and his elk shape classes that people were asking if he ever has issues with these catching on like six. Cause I mean, elk hunting's you're running and gunning, you're going Mm -hmm. like running, gunning, turkey hunting too. Well, and you're Um, going through some, mm -hmm. some junk every now and again. Like, you know, I hunt, um, uh, Western Washington, like periodically, not every year, but like, you go through some stuff, yeah. You yeah. know, um, and I was I was just on a on a on a on a different hunt. Basically, it was like jungle. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're you're pushing your but like you don't have a choice. Like yep. you and your bow are going going through some stuff. But yeah, I was talking to Dan because I was trying to ferret out. Um, you know, just getting my bow to shoot. And like I said, I honestly, at the end of the day, I don't even know if it was a gear issue. I think it could have been. Yeah. I think it could have been me. I think it could have been my head. Um, all I know is at the end of the day, before my trip. Uh, the bow was shooting great and yeah. my confidence was through the roof. So that was yep. awesome. But we were going through some different variables and he's like, Oh, what, what rest is he? And I was like, yeah, I got a cable driven left rest. And he's like, Oh, you're living that cable life, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. and so he's, he's big into the limb driven. Um, I can't say I've ever at least personally noticed a problem being created by a cable driven yeah. rest, but I mean, just uh, the only issue I've ever had with them is eventually, you know, that spring wears out or eventually it, um, um and I've, I've never taken one apart, so I don't know a hundred percent how it all works, but I know as they wear out, you'll eventually, you could get, uh, it, uh fletching contact. But again, I am very open-minded with everything, but I mean, even my gear, like I don't get two set in stone on just one way. I like to have an open mind. I like to know, I mean, obviously that's how we got to where we are today is having an open mind. Otherwise we'd still be cavemen smashing things with rocks, but I mean, we certainly things have to change. We certainly wouldn't have wheels on our bows, would yes. we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. You imagine the first guy that, that uh, introduced a, a wheeled bow and everybody probably looked at him like he was, you know, nuts, but, uh, and here we are today. And that happens with everything. So keeping an open mind is, is, is important, not it, get too set in stone. Yeah, which I think is um, it's tough in this game, right? Because once you find something that works, yep. it probably took you a while to get there. Yep. You know what I mean? So it's hard to like branch out and be like, oh, I'm going to try something different. Yep. Like Unless you're like that tinkering mindset where you kind of have that, that wonder of... Yep. Uh, of uh well, what about this what about yep. that but uh yeah i think that's that's definitely a good thing to uh to do so talking about um talking a little bit about the rest like i think we talked a little bit about kind of finding that that center shot you know you're gonna have yep. that spot where it's like center shot where your rest is on zero yep. this is one thing i've talked to a couple different um you know like pro shops uh some are like adamant that like set the bow to spec, mm-hmm. the rest is on zero for a reason, you know, kind of a little bit like anything else is up up, t- up to you, and others are like, no, like, this is a very customizable thing, that's why those adjustments are there, if you need to make an adjustment because of, like, whatever, your, your, your style of shooting, the way you're shooting the bow, like, hey, let's, let's make that adjustment, um, where do you fall, where do you fall? in in that um so there's there's like there's bow squares and stuff and trying to get make sure your arrow is coming off straight um i know ranch ferry is a huge advocate for this is just get your arrow coming off straight i mean that's the main that's the main thing um i don't get too caught up in you know the the perfection side of making sure this is where it needs to be right off the bat just because it's probably going to change down the road um and that's from like whether it's broadhead tuning or tuning bear shaft tuning or uh, all kinds. So of you're stuff. talking about just like adjustments, adjusting yep. of the rest in particular, yep. right? So initially, you just want your rest coming off. You want your arrow coming off straight. So set the rest off up that it's coming off straight, and that is going to change. Um, there's multiple ways. Your up and down is that's just done with a square. Then you put a square on here. It's got a, a straight ninety. That's going to get you straight ninety off your string in its resting position. Um, some a lot of bow manufacturers will have like a reference mark on the inside of the riser here um, it'll be a line basically giving you a, like a close you know point there 
and you'll see that in um, if you paper tune um, you'll see uh, if the, the knock is kicking up or down you'll see that in the paper tune mm -hmm. um, that can be adjusted out by rising or lowering your your rest and then you'll see a lot of these drapways are coming into uh, micro adjustments that are really really nice so then you can really fine tune that because a little bit goes a long way with the rest um, but they uh, as far as your left and right, that's going to be a bit tricky um, just because you got to shoot the bow, and that's going to change. It changes. Anytime you change anything on your arrow, um, your left and right is probably going to change. Mm -hmm. um, how that arrow is coming off, the spine of your arrow, um, all of that is going to change. Um, so it's, it, I'd say it's, it's common practice, paper tune, get the arrow coming straight off. You're mm -hmm. getting bullet holes through paper. Um, that's another thing you can do right at home. You don't have to go to a bow shop. Um, I just take cardboard boxes. You cut a square out of it and you put a piece of paper, you tape over it and you can shoot through that. Um, you don't need the full draw board and everything like that where they are not draw board, but the draw, like the, the paper that they pull down. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a starting point, mm -hmm. but like we kind of mentioned before, you know, we don't get it shooting bullet holes, but it's probably going to change. So keep that in mind. One thing that I, at least I think I'd be curious to get your take on it, is like when I'm going through that process, kind of jumping ahead, we'll jump back. Mm -hmm. But when I'm going through that process of like, like sighting in, paper tuning, all the things, like if it's going to be on my bow when I hunt, I want it on my bow when I'm doing those things. Yeah. Because I feel like anytime you add something to the bow, you, you're changing the dynamic of the bow. 100%. Like whether that's, uh, you know, I, I shoot quiver on mm -hmm. like all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't take my quiver off to shoot. So when I do all my tuning, when I do this setup, whatever, yep. um, or excuse me, I should say when I go to the bow shop to yep. have them help me with my tuning, um, if it's on the bow, it's on the bow. Sure. So that's, yep. um, that's good practice too. And if you make an addition, or change something, be prepared to have things change. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, I know, like quiver, I shoot quiver off. I take my quiver and I put it in my pack. Um, my wife and I both. Um, actually, she's she's been shooting because she switched to a tight spot. Um, she's been shooting with her quiver on, I think. But I don't like, I'm, I'm like a minimalist. I hate like a bunch of stuff. Like picking up this bow right here, there's nothing wrong with it. I bet you the thing shoots lights out. Mm -hmm. but it's heavy like mm -hmm. this this is a chunky girl like oh yeah this is this is just heavy and i would hate to have to carry that around i really would um but there's there's it's just like a a, and a rifle too um rifles the heavier the rifle the easier it is to shoot the better you're going to shoot it yep yep so and i'm a minimal i'm a little guy i mean if you're not watching this on on youtube i'm i'm not a big dude so weight is one of the big factors that slows me down in the west um i'm a minimal minimal minimalist with everything that i do as far as all my gear i try to be as efficient as possible um i don't we'll touch on this too um it's not an essential thing and that's been proven many times but stabilizers stabilizers are great they can balance out a bow they can make you shoot really well. You'll see target shooters that have four or five foot long stabilizers come out the front. That makes that dot. If you get one of them really long ones, that dot just sits there. It doesn't even move. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's really nice. But then the minute you go and take that off, all of a sudden it's like this. And you can't even keep it on target. But um, I I did some experimenting myself. I shot with a stabilizer. I've shot lots of different stabilizers. I've shot without them. And I didn't see any significant change in my groups, even out. To, I shoot out to 90 yards. Um, I've shot further than that. I shoot out 120 at my old place. But um, I like to shoot long distance because 20 yards feels like nothing. But um, even out to those distances, I didn't see anything change, you know, with a practical hunting stabilizer. Target is different. Uh, mm -hmm. But a practical mm -hmm. stabilizer like this setup here, you're just balancing the bow at that point and dampening noise. I mean, they, there's a lot of different ones that just dampen noise. But... Um, and I, you're, oh God, I can imagine the comments on that. People are going to say that's so st stupid not to shoot a stabilizer. But I, Ryan Lampers, Ryan Lampers doesn't shoot with a. And I, I, man, I know, a, seen, I know a couple guys that don't. And, and I have heard, I have heard um, that you know some of the shorter, again, like this is like a very, this is a very general statement. But I have heard that like if you're shooting just you know, maybe like a shorter, lighter weight front, just a front stabilizer. Mm -hmm. 
it's not gonna have like a a, 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 a a dramatic effect on you know yep. on the bow. I've always shot with a, with a front stabilizer. Actually, Eric and I just did a podcast on. Uh, I think it'll be uh, launching here fairly in the near future on sure. on back bars. Kind of like sure. more more on the back bar. You know, to back yep. bar bar or not to back bar. There, yep. um, there's one on this bow. You yes, know, it's is. got a front and yep. and a and a rear. Um, and we're just countering weight is what we're doing. We're balancing count, the just bow. Just balancing the bow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I think like if you're gonna do it, then do it, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Like you know, because some of that you know some of those just smaller front ones probably aren't gonna have a dramatic effect on yeah. on on balancing your bow. Um, yeah. Very t- cool. Let's talk about. Oh, get, what you're going with to, the sight now? Get the important part. Is that next, or did you have something in between there? Um. We can go with t- tuning. Um, a I know little, if that let's was do a little, a little tuning timing thing. Yep. Like you were talking about mods earlier with the draw yep. length, draw length, and things like that. What's going on with uh, uh, timing? Yeah, we so, got two. We got two wheels on this bow. Yep, absolutely. Um, two cams. T- I'm calling them wheels. But. Timing is very important. Just like um, obviously, uh, you know, on a motor, obviously there's timing in your in your system as well because everything needs to happen at the exact or let's say at a certain time, with this case, at the same time. Um, we need these two cams on this bow to come back to its resting place at the exact same point. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're starting to get more of like, if we think about as that string's coming forward, if one's pulling more than the other, mm-hmm. you're starting to get where it's going to pull your arrow down or it could pull your arrow up. And then you think that there's an issue with your rest, and you start to change that. And now all you're doing is trying to fix a, a problem that's, happening and you won't get it to paper tune or your bear shaft and your bear shafts will be all crazy but you can fix it with a fletching you just be chasing your tail and you don't we don't want to do that no no <laughs> so um you'll do it a lot though with a, with a bow but yes so timing is basically getting these two cams to do everything exactly the same time um there are timing marks on a bow you'll see this one um i believe that's a timing mark there um these i I haven't, I haven't shot a prime. I've never messed with a prime. They're, they're goofy in themselves that they have like dual, dual cams and, um, gets all crazy, but they have timing marks on these. So when you're at full draw, you'll notice that your timing mark will line up with one of your cables. Um, and you can basically, you can check your timing yourself at home. Um, actually adjusting the timing, that's something you'll need a press. Um, probably if, I mean, if you like to tinker, get a press, um, cause that's going to allow you to do so many things with a bow, but, um, you'll have to press the bow and then you'll have to adjust your, your string twist. Basically we're adjusting our twi- string twist to bring one in, one out. Um, when you draw it's back crazy what bow, I've, the one thing that was like astonishing to me is like the difference, like just like one or two twists. Oh makes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. When you make adjustments, it's, it's like half a twist. Yeah. Check half a twist. Um, if your bow is further out than that, then and you really got some issues, probably somewhere else, like a stretch string or something or um, something else going on there. But yeah, um, you'll you'll see when you come to full draw, you'll be able to look at your cams um, and you'll see that timing dot. Or if you got a buddy, have them check out where that timing dot is. Another reason why I don't like cable stops, so you'll notice on these, so there's a, obviously that bow comes back. Mm-hmm. Something has to stop it from just keep going. Mm-hmm. Um so that would be uh, uh, either a cable stop. So you'll see this one has the little cable stops in here. Um, they come around and then they, they'll make contact with the cable. Okay. Um, then there's limb stops. So limb stops will be on the outside when this cam com- or when the, this cam comes all the way around, it'll hit on the, on the limb. Right. I like limb. It's, same, it's kind of the same thing with uh, limb driven versus um, right. cable driven on the rest. I like a hard, solid back wall. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you've ever, if you ever drew a bow, if anybody's ever drawn a bow and they feel it spongy in the back wall. Just kind of mushy back there. Yeah, yeah. I hate that. Um, so that's why I prefer, usually when you get into higher poundages, that's not an issue, but especially low poundages, like like when I'm messing with my wife's bow or like a kid's bow, there's just so much sponge there with the cable because you can see these cables, they have stretch, you know, we're mm-hmm. never going to make them solid. Um so that's, that's two, two styles, but so setting, setting your, um, as far as your draw, your draw stop, that'll, that'll actually be something that they set with your, with your draw length. If that's set too far, so you can adjust your, your let off as well. And right. you can adjust your valley. So, uh, one like this, you'll notice 
this prime bow, you'll see that it's basically just a cut slot. It's a, a machine slot that you can adjust that stop mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. So we are going to want that those both to hit the cable, to touch the cable at the exact same time. So that's how you set those. There are some that are just pins where you just set the pin. Um, then you're a little bit more limited. Um, and then you have to start messing with string twists to get them both to touch at the same time. Gotcha. Um, but... So you can kind of play with your, if you're really big into tinkering, there's a setting. Like if you look at the bow manufacturer, they're going to tell you put it this at this number, A, B. You'll see there's all these letters and markings in here, and you, they'll tell you exactly where it's set up for their spec. Um, that's all reliant on this string being absolutely, that's reliant on everything just being perfect with mm -hmm. the bow. Sometimes it's not. So it's really nice. You can fudge with your, um, your let off. And your valley. So that's two things too when you get really into this is you can adjust that valley. If you like a deep valley or you like to where you draw back and it goes donk and it feels like it's forever before you, you know, it takes off on you. Or some guys like to have to hold pressure and they like it super jumpy. Um, so that'll adjust, you know, can be fine tuned with your, with yeah. your draw stops. Yeah, some of that stuff is a little bit, you know, personal preference. And that's why yep. people will even gravitate towards one bow or another. They're like, oh, this one feels good to me. And then yeah. their buddy's like, no way, dude. This one's way yeah. better. And know? what's crazy is you could set that, probably that same bow up to feel good for both guys. Interesting. Um, you know, if, if you're into tinkering and really fine tuning this stuff, depending on the bow, obviously. And I'll say these bows are so damn good these oh, days. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. um, you're going to be pretty damn close with like what the manufacturer is oh, yeah. you to do. Yeah, no, 100%. What they have set up is 100% going to work probably optimally. But if you if you just have that that feeling like, man, I just wish that that valley was a little deeper. You know, I hate that like when as soon as I start to relax into my bow, it wants to jump on me. Like you can adjust that stuff. So um like what, go valley. Like what do you mean by valley? Like so, go through some of those terms. Yeah, that so you're about. so you're Part of your cam here, like the mod on, on the other ones, they're going to have basically, um, that's going to control your draw cycle So and the full wheel here. Um, but basically the steepness of, you'll see these, these grooves are machined, that's going to change how that feels when you come back. So you're going to have like the peak and then it's going to kind of roll over and then it's going to drop into what would be, it's called your valley. Um, that's after you get past that peak you know, torque of the bow in the draw cycle and it drops down into what's called the valley. The valley is where you're at your full draw and it's where you're at your uh, let off. So that's a benefit to compounds over recurves and long bows, um, older bows is there's a let off. So recurves, like if you shoot a 50 pound recurve, one, you know, you're a pretty stout dude with some strong fingers because 50 pound recurve, that's tough to hold that all the way back at its full point at 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. That's that's a lot of weight to hold right there. Where compounds are really nice because we're just getting that past that point and then we have to only hold at a much lower rate. Usually it's it's between 75 and some actually up to 90 um, uh, for the let off, 90%. Mm -hmm. um, there are some states that had some limitations on that, which actually get overlooked quite a bit. Like Colorado has a limitation on, uh, on the let off. And I actually, I'm pretty sure I just seen that they're changing that, which is good. Um, or it is changed. I couldn't remember, but I remember reading that. I think they had it on a Go Hunt article or something. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it seems like forever. 65 was like the... Yeah. Uh, My that, old bear bow was a 65. I mean, yeah. it seemed like for a lot of years, yeah, 65, 65, that's the standard. And now I feel like it, like 80 and 85 yeah. are kind of like the new let off yep. standard. I could yeah. be totally wrong. It's no. just I feel like that's yeah. like... Um, Absolutely. I guess it's like my anecdotal or whatever. Oh, like I would agree with that 100%. Um, there are a few like uh, Athens archery. So Athens makes some pretty cool bows. I shot them for a while. Um, I might even go back because they've been making some pretty cool stuff here lately. But um, Athens, uh, they had a few bows with a 90% let off. Um, I shot them. They're, they're almost weird to try to let an arrow down because it feels like the bow's stuck. Um, and that actually can't happen. You've probably seen a uh, few YouTube videos there too, where somebody will have their draw or their, um, they'll either forget to put them in or they'll have them set too far. And what'll happen is that cam will come over through the valley and it'll actually lock up. So you're going past your valley and you're getting on the other side of the draw cycle and your bow will lock up. It'll, you can literally let off the string, the strings just dangle in there and the bow is compressed. Your cams are, uh, your cables are compressed all the way and locked. Um, and it, if that happens, Sorry, because <laughs> I have it's rough. I haven't seen that before. Some people. I, I don't want to. Yeah, then you got to put it in a press. Um, it's very dangerous at that point because the bow can literally just explode at any point. But um, or, you know, 
hold hold your bow have a if you got a buddy there hopefully you do if you have a buddy there have him cycle your cams whilst you holding your your draw back and then you can get it to come forward but yeah so that's really scary stuff too but you're like we said the valley is basically a feel thing some bows um there's not much valley at all some bows have a super deep valley and the valley is just a feel so when you hear about anybody talking about a valley that's what they're talking about is that feel of the of the drop off of your draw cycle right you'll get a peak and then you'll get a huge drop off so if we were to put that on a graph that's exactly what mm-hmm. it would look like and then the um, back wall that people talk about that a lot as back well. wall is basically how s- solid this you know the stop your draw stop hits something if it's into a cable and you have a, a lower draw um, weight it'll your back wall will probably feel spongy mm-hmm. and if you hear a lot of people talk about that having a solid black back wall to a spongy back wall um, that's just all is determining on the type of uh, draw stop and that's have. just like when when you're at full, full draw, draw just like you know can you yep can you move it can you move it mm-hmm. yeah yep so. um cool you're gonna talk you're gonna touch on uh sites sites, sites. are a little bit different i remember yeah. uh, you know uh we well, number one, we have, they've just come a really, 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 really long way. Yep. And it's almost like, I feel like there's um, parallels, not parallel limbs, just regular parallels, uh, between like archery sites that you dial nowadays. You don't have to. A lot of great fixed pin sites out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a great podcast on that if you want to watch that too. There you go. Um, or, uh, and then like these scopes that we dial nowadays. And I feel like range finders and essentially mm-hmm. ballistic computers mm-hmm. have like changed the game for, yeah. for, for rifle scopes and archery sites. Yeah. Um, but let's, yeah, so let's talk about the site and how that's working with the bow, what you want to do, setting that up, uh, maybe even yeah. sighting in. Yep. Absolutely. So and it, it, isn't it kind of crazy how a lot of these things kind of crossover from archery to rifle and mm-hmm. when you talk about this stuff you can if you don't know what you like think about what you set, have set up for your rifle you know if you're a rifle hunter coming over to archery um but yeah so basically with your site that is that is going to be what is controlling where that arrow is going as far as where you perceive that arrow is going to go um it's it's a two-part system you have a peep sight on the back in your string mm-hmm. and then you have the site up front um basically what the peep sight is doing is allowing two things one for us to look through the string because that's going to give us the, the most perfect line of sight um, and it also gives us a reference point for the back just like iron sights you need a, the back two sights and then you need the front you have to line those up otherwise you know it doesn't work out uh, maybe someday vortex will figure out a red dot system of states that allow it that you know gets rid of a peeps out but then you still need it to look through the string so um, the as far as the site adjustables they'll have adjustable sites or they'll have fixed bin um, now we even have multi adjustables um which are beginning to be pretty popular i mean that's what i've gone to is a is a three pin you know three pin slider yep yeah so i i do 20 30 40 yeah and then after that you know i'll i'll you know i'll turn or dial yeah uh we shot back up to when i started i had there was just an an iron plate that come off the front with multiple slots and then there was little pins that stuck out just little mm-hmm. uh, little pins that you had to screw on to the backside. Brass, like a, yep. no fiber optics. Little painted, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, little, oh little if you painted dot. You'd make your own fiber optic with <laughs> nail polish. Yeah, yeah, yep, absolutely. So, mom, that, I need your I need your nail polish. I'm gonna go shoot my bow. <laughs> Touching up the bow, yeah. So that's where that's where we came from. Um, and prior to that, it was obviously instinctive shooting, no shooting. And there's still people that do that better than most people do with compound, like Tim Wells, that guy's he's awesome. But um, the the sight on this bow here in front of us, for those who are watching, this is an adjustable uh, multi pin, mm-hmm. multi multi multi, maybe a few multis on there. He's got what's he got? Is this five pin? One, two, three, four, five pin slider. You'll, um, you'll also actually notice that. Um, Taylor's got his release on his bow. Mm-hmm. And I think it was Remy Warren, which this is really good advice. Your release is either on your bow or on your wrist. Yeah. Like those are the options. Yep. Otherwise you will forget it. He also never sets anything down. It's either he's using it or it's back in his Put pack. Away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that's another. Uh, that's good. That's a really I, good tip. I'm going to start trying to live that life. Yeah. Um, losing too much stuff out there. But yeah, so he's got yeah, five pin, five pin mover here. Yep. So basically what we're doing there is um, 
like if I guess if we back up a little bit to just setting your site, it's the site system. When I first started, was the the, uh, the metal pins. It's just giving you a point of reference in front of you to put on target to line up in the center of your peep um, to use as a point of reference for point of aim. Um, the an, an adjustable is going to be where that dials up and down, um, that moves to change the distance. Uh, much like a rifle scope, you have the turrets. Um, bo- uh, ar- archery sights and um, optics in general for uh, rifles and bows, both, they, uh, you can dial them, dial them to adjust to where, because obviously nothing is perfect. We have to dial our sight, our point of sight, uh, to line up with the point of impact. Um, at some point, we did it with rifles, and then obviously we did it with archery, where now we can actually use that to dial for elevation. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have fixed pin, and then from the from the um, those old irons we had, I moved up to it was like a crosshair with a fiber optic in the center, but it was still stationary. Okay, um, but I still shot 20, 30 yards, and I just knew how high to aim um, for thirty yards. With obviously technologies advancing archery equipment we start to shoot further and further and further so that you know we had now the desire to dial that same thing with rifles you know Mm -hmm. it was always set it on 100 or set it on 200 and you're good you know shooting 800 yards was was just crazy you know not not too long ago um so where at some point they implemented that an exposed turret that we can dial for distance you know same thing with a with an archery setup Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's almost like a, a regular, I'll say regular, whatever, like a like a fixed multi-pin sight would be like just a rifle scope that you sight in, you know, and then, you know, you might have, and then you have your BDCs. Yeah, it's, in like a our, way. Yeah, it's like our 4 to 16, uh, our 4 to 16 by uh, our HSLR has the dead hold BDC reticle, and then you also have an exposed turret. That's much like having multiple pins and still being able to dial. Right. Um, it's... Uh, I don't think anyone is better. I, I've always shot since I was able to. I was all, I've always shot a single pin, and then from there I moved to multi-pin sights, and I just didn't like the obstruction. I didn't like not being able to see anything other than you know a bunch of stuff in your way. But um, so I went to a single pin. But as far as setting up your your, um, it's funny, and then it goes back to personal preference because mm-hmm. I've always shot multi-pin sights. I tried to go to a single pin this didn't year. Like it. And like remembering to adjust it and all that stuff that bites you in the butt too. I just I bailed like I need like I'm like mentally like just for me like at least how I perceive things happening like to be able to just mm-hmm. at least at twenty thirty forty and be able to have those holds like at Absolutely. just there and then mm-hmm. dial after that. I mean and and, and you know I mean I mean part of me even like. I'm like, should I have a four pin slider? Um, five pin? What uh like this one here? But uh I think I've settled on three. But that's interesting. And again, it goes back to personal mm-hmm. personal preference. Like, I mean, there's definitely got so are you just leaving your single we actually did this. We did this in the podcast too, single pin versus multi pin. Um mm-hmm. and yeah, so like are you leaving yours at thirty then and then just holding high or lower? Are you just dial like yep. nope, I'm gonna take the time to dial for every shot. Um, I do. I dial, leave it on 20. I dial for all shots. Um, I've done that in the past where I tried to be more efficient and put it on like a 30 that way. You know, I knew I could either hold low or hold high and it bit me in the butt on a deer. Um, nice buck come in. I was not prepared. I really, I didn't have anything on camera. So I had, I, I didn't expect anything. And I just turned around big CRP grass field and I turned around and looked and he was standing there at 20 yards. You know, I just, you know, in the heat of the moment, it's it's kind of one of those things where a, a lot of the information that that we learn goes out the window. It's no longer there. So um, when I grabbed my bow, I just pulled it over, clipped my release. I was ecstatic that I was even at that point. Got full draw on him uh, without him knowing that I was there, and uh, let it fly. And he ducked just enough that it went right over his back um, because the pin was set on thirty yards. Now. Can I, you can't ever tell what could or would have happened the other way. I could have spined him. I could have hit him high. I never found him. There's a lot of different things. But right. if you try to be efficient and set it on, you know, on 30 yards, it can, it can bite you in the butt or it can be really efficient. So you don't have to adjust. But I like to adjust. And now with the technologies of arrows and every, it went from super fast, you know, light arrows. Now it's going back into the heavier stuff. Um, that's where 
making sure your range is correct is important. Mm -hmm. You know, a heavy arrow is definitely, you need to make sure you have your range. And that's part of you as a hunter to, to know, you know, not just guessing and then being upset that your arrow is too heavy that you missed a shot. It's like, well, yeah. So, um, as far as setting up the site, uh, purchasing a site, um, you can get anything from super simple. It's kind of where I was going with that. Super simple setups, um, or you can get really complex setups like this. I shoot a trophy ridge. I love the micro adjustments and the toolless adjustment on a trophy ridge. You just basically, it has like a lever that you snap them open. That'll loosen everything up. You can micro adjust your sight um, and then lock it back in. And mm-hmm. I can make adjustments on the fly because um, I'm always thinking. I'm always, if I want to see how a different broadhead shoots or a different head weight or stuff like that, I can just make those quick adjustments. Um, as opposed to cracking everything loose and then trying to uh, make adjustments by your hand or whatever. You, it's a toolless method. That's really nice to do if you're out west. Not, you know, if you forget your tools or whatever else, you can make those adjustments. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. And so you'll have, um, I think, probably, you know, one of the most important, what we're finding to be important today, because we're shooting a lot more steep angles, western hunting, is that third axis. And it's one that was kind of looked over for a long, long time. Now you'll see more um, sites that, they're implementing the third axis adjustment mm-hmm. and your third axis is basically you're setting up, you know, your site left and right and it changes your bubble level. Right. So let's go, let's, so on a site like this and a lot of sites these days, you're going to have your first, <laughs> second, third axis. Yep. So yep. what are, what are, what are one and two? So first axis, gosh, I'm going to probably murder these cause you never talk about them, but, um, so your first axis basically is setting up your, your, um, your level this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm probably switching these around. I mean, it's kind of, I think it's just kind of like, I mean, it's like you're, you're up, it's kind of like. You're setting your, your what is the idea of is you're setting your rest perfectly true to your, to your riser. Um, and I think those, the, uh, your first and second are, are, are something that I think is pretty standard. Usually when you bolt it to it, mm-hmm. um, there can, obviously there can be variances in how it bolts on, but that's going to be, a lot of those aren't um, 100% adjustable. It's obviously just set. Um, but your third axis is one you'll see on the front, you'll see your three, three dots. And basically that's the one that's going to adjust it this way. Um, when you start tolerance stacking with all this extra adjustments and on here, you're going to get to the point where you're going to have to adjust those things to be true to the riser or true to the, you know, to the, the shot of the bow. Um, you'll, you'll see like with a third axis adjustment, you'll see, I think the only reason I talk about that one more, cause it's, it's fairly new, um, as far as, I don't want to say it's new, but it's something like that's been accounting really, for it. Yeah, yeah, it's been really the talk. Um, and that's just making sure that, you know, that when we make a steep adjustment that we want that bubble level to be, you know, perfectly true to, um, true to earth so that when we adjust it down, your bubble doesn't give you a false reading and you'll just start canning your bow. Um, so that's important, but basically what those three axes are doing is making sure that your sight is perfectly plumb to the, to the riser of the bow and the shot of the bow. So arrows, arrows, I mean, that's, that's the other thing. We got to have yeah. something to shoot gotta out of some, these darn yeah, things. You got to have something to send down range. Um, there's lots of options, lots of them. And this is another thing that everybody's been arguing about, but, um, I think it's, as long as it shoots well, you're going to do just fine. Um, we've, we, and I say we, as in just archery community together, we've, you know, done a lot with light arrows and fast arrows, and we've done a lot with heavy arrows. And, um, in my opinion, whichever one you like, go with it. You know, I'm not going to be that guy that's going to tell you, no, you have to do this. Now I will tell you that I've, I, I now shoot heavy arrows because I've seen the benefits. Um, from heavy arrows to FOC, and, you know, obviously it's physics. You can't argue physics, but in the same sense, you know, there are, you can still get it done with what's on, you know, what we've been using uh, before, which is light, lighter arrows. I know a lot of gentlemen, I know a guy that shoots super uh, light arrows, uh, super weak spine. Most people would look at a setup and say that's way too underspined. That's not going to shoot well. He shoots really well. He kills elk, you know, he has full passers. So it works. Um, but I can say that heavy arrows are definitely going to do better um, as far as penetration-wise. Um, they're easier, I, in my opinion, they're easier to, to tune a bow to. Um, there's, there's, quite a bit of, there's quite a bit of stuff happening when that bow goes off and comes to a rest. And if you ever see that in like those slow, super slow motion oh, it's videos. wild. Yeah, the bow is doing all kinds of stuff. So, and the arrow as well. So the, the more uh, 
the, the heavier the object that we're trying to put all of that energy into, the more it's going to be able to absorb it. And it's kind of smooths everything out as it goes through. But um, so you'll you'll probably find that a heavier arrow will tune a little easier um, than a lighter one. But as far as making our selection, it's based off of our draw length and our poundage. Gosh, this is like a whole nother rabbit hole in itself. So you with an arrow, it's going to come down to grains per inch of the arrow, how it's constructed, and the spine of the arrow. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's static... And the spine is essentially how stiff that arrow is. Yep, that's correct. So there's static spine and dynamic spine. Um, static spine is what you're looking at on the number here. That's basically at rest at a set distance. I believe it's like 28 inches. They set it on a, on a spine uh, device, and then they hang a weight from it, and then they measure how far it, it bends. I mean, making it quite simple there. Um, simple to understand. So what happens there is that gives us our static spine. So our static spine is is going to tell us how st- basically the stiffness of that arrow. Um, there's you're going to find there's lots of different options from aluminum to carbon to hybrid carbon aluminums. And some have aluminum on the inside, carbon on the outside, and aluminum on the outside. Lots of different options. Um, just pick one that you like. Really, I mean, they're all going to do the same job. So, um, I've had I've had some aluminum carbon hybrids that I felt like weren't as durable as some carbons and I have some carbons that were super there's different configurations to the carbon and how it's weaved and how it's made yeah. um, there's different aluminums you know a cheap aluminum is not going to be the same or do the same as um, as a, a, a higher grade aluminum um, arrows are definitely their own podcast they are there's there's I'm trying to just kind of st- for make somebody sure you, that make sure you have an arrow that's cut to the proper length yep properly yep. spined yep. and uh yep so is shooting straight <laughs> yep and there's cal- there's if you go on the, any manufacturer is going to be able to tell you don't go off just a set number because ma- some manufacturers run their numbers different as far as their their spine so mm-hmm. um they'll all have it on their website where you can look up the um the, what spine is going to be rated for your draw length and your poundage mm-hmm. um and the draw length is important just because of the length of the arrow so that's going to change your spine obviously you can tune and then you can get into arrow tuning um which pr- prior to compounds when the before we had all this fancy stuff that we could adjust it was just a stick and a string so i mean we literally had to tune with the arrow you know changing the weight changing the length and all that stuff so you know it's still very very common in recurve and long bows is to change you know tuning with your arrow not with the bow mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. and there but i mean it's not you can certainly do some of that you know like if you've 100%. got you can 100%. you can have there's some leeway there yep. like you you might cut your arrow a little bit shorter or a little bit longer and that's going to change the spine of the arrow going to make it shoot a little bit different yep um you know, the shorter it gets, the yep. that will increase the spine. So, yep. and that's changing that's changing your dynamic spine. So that's mm-hmm. different than the number. So we're not actually changing the arrow any. We're just changing what happens when it's fired. Exactly. So, exactly. Yep. Um, yeah, the arrow rabbit hole. Holy yeah. mackerel. Yep. And it's, it's it's really difficult to try to keep things simple and still try to talk about all the stuff you like to talk about. But oh, um, then, but as far and then as fletchings, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I mean, just. A million styles out yes. there right now. Yes. You know, styles, yep. some are more uh, pliable than others, you yep. know. Like, I'd say, like, you know, um, I shot the uh, the AE Max Stealth on my previous bow, and I actually, I really liked them. But it's, like, you know, a little bit softer. I think I've got the uh, tack veins on my new bow, mm-hmm. um, and those are working great as well. So they're yeah. both working great. Yep. I shot the uh, the blazers. I'm, you know, I remember when the blazers were like this new thing, and I was like, it was like such a far departure from any vein I'd seen before. Like it mm-hmm. took me a while to get used to them, and then mm-hmm. I shot them, and they worked great. So yeah. like, I don't know. There's the ones that you slide over. Um, those are kind of still like experimental type. But there's like the ones that I have, I'm totally drawing a blank on the names of them. But it started out with like a what was it a pog or a pod or it was basically just a round one that slid over the the shaft from the rear. Um, and then there was a gosh was it G was it uh, G5 that made one that slid over the back. I think I it was. I can't remember. Like there, there like were like these the sh- weird like the shrink wrap ones. No, you mean, or? no, no, no. It was like a 
Um, it was like a lighted knock system, but it had like it, the fletchings on it. It was a goofy system. Um, mm-hmm. I ran them for a while. Um, I've made my own fletchings with a uh, 3D printer. Same system where you slide it over the back. Um, just basically, it's just veins on a, on a piece mm-hmm. that you slide over and then glue it in place. I'd say most commonly, you're going to see some sort of, yep. you know, I'd say synthetic you yep. know, like you still see feathers in certain cases nowadays, yeah. part, you know, particularly on like, you know, trad style bows, things yep. like that. Uh, some compound guys are still shooting feathers, but you're going to see some sort of, you know, synthetic vein. Um, lots of different, you know, looks. Everybody's got their uh, their spin mm-hmm. on it, Travis, uh, yep. pun intended there. And um, yeah, again, that's going to come down to personal preference, but it will affect how it, how your arrow f- you know, passes through the air. So, you know, definitely yep. be There's be mindful of that. Three fletching, four fletching. Um, mm-hmm. I know Ranch Fair has been doing with the hunting public guys. They've been doing some really cool um, research um, down there in Texas with heel coals and speed. And they're doing a lot of work with a lab radar, which is super cool because I've always wanted to do that. Um, know what the arrow is doing more than just right here in front of us. You know, what is it doing downrange? Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of justifies a lot of the stuff with heavy, heavy arrows and FOC arrows and um, you can you can watch their stuff it's super cool but if you like if you like to geek out on mm-hmm. that kind of stuff but the fletching thing was one thing um, that was was really intriguing to me because it did exactly opposite of what I thought it would do and I think um, I think the ranch fair was a little little discombobbled by it as well he seemed like he's like oh that's not what I thought it would do but what it was is stronger helical so you put let's say four fletch super strong helical you're thinking that's going to slow that arrow way down and the numbers between a a super low profile three vein with no you know straight fletch with no helical and the difference between that and like a four fletch with a super heavy helical Mm -hmm. the feet per seconds were like two hmm Three. I mean, we're talking not at the bow. We're talking downrange. Right. So that's that's the stuff that you know we had just recently been able to test. Not just not just what's happening as it's coming out of the bow. Was the accuracy was, improved though? By it does because you're improving stabilization. So you're automatically whether it's. I mean, now that that would be interesting to test with wind drift because you're spinning the arrow, so you're increasing. We're getting a little deep there, but you're yeah. increasing. Um, and this this Gyrostopic. is just this is just one example of basically the multiple yeah. rabbit holes you can just yeah. start going down with these. Yeah. Uh, so spinning anything is is gyroscopic uh, stabilization. You're basically spinning it to stabilize it, to, and it reduces you know um, outer effects on it to change its course of path. Same thing with a football or arrows or bullets or all anything that we put a spin on. Um, so increasing the spin is going to increase your stabilization, and it's going to should decrease any effects to it. So, um, outer effects trying to change the point of impact, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. which is super cool. But it's, that's a cool thing. So f- even fletchings themselves now, you know, have their own little rabbit hole. You can go down and geek out on and change, and they have lots of colors. But as far as like the new guy getting into it, just get something that's already pre-fletched. That way you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. Um, they'll usually, I think, almost everybody has a pre-fletch with a blazer vein. Blazer vein is almost. You know, for a long time, is industry standard. They're a really good vein, mm-hmm. super short. Most of them are like the two inch blazers. They're they're good. They'll work for you. Um, the idea with a fletching is just basically to spin that arrow to stabilize it. You mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. Um, but that will be probably something that you'll at first you'll just buy something that's already set up. But if you like to tinker again, you can do all that. I was gonna say like I'm not a big tinker, but then at the same time, like like we're just talking about fletchings like i've tried like three different fletchings in the yeah. last and and it's and sometimes going away from something that was working perfectly fine yeah what's wrong with this travis yeah that that is tinkering that is just the the want to try something different some of us like to do it more yeah this is wor- can- this is working great let's see let's see if i can change that i don't know it's, yeah. it's a sickness it is um, it is trust me we did talk a little you know so you've got it's like you know we've talked about the sights a little bit you know kind of getting your your bow set up um breast stabilization you know getting your bow sighted in you know i'd say again th- a lot of the stuff is one-on-one stuff but yep, like that's your first and second access um, stuff that's adjusting your sight to yeah um, um yeah you know get 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 your bow set up then you're, you're gonna want to paper tune it you know we talked a little bit about that before just make sure you're you know when that arrow is going through paper uh it uh you know, you're kind of getting that you know quotation mark perfect bullet hole where it looks you know you're not getting like any wild tears left right up down i have heard that like a slight up 
like upper tear is like less critical than sure. and and some of the stuff you have to see to maybe know what we're describing. But there's there's you know obviously this will not be the only archery resource uh, on on the interweb. So you can kind of like you know check some of these things that we're talking about here. Um, everybody has fact their check system. Us. Yeah, um, everybody has their system. That's one thing to keep in mind because I mean just. I can I can almost foresee it already. If you just read through the comments of this, is everybody's gonna say, "Well, this is a better way," or "That's a better way." It's been evolving and changing, and there's so many ways. Every way is still good. It's still it's it's the process of getting this you know piece of equipment to shoot this piece of equipment good. I mean, that's yeah. that's the idea, and try to keep it simple because. You if can, you're not watching on YouTube, Travis pointing at the bow yep. and the arrow. The bow and the arrow, that's what it's about. Getting this bow to shoot this straight, that's really what it's all about. Um, and yes, you can geek out on every little piece of it, you know, internally. But um, I think that's that's the main key, um, especially with this podcast too, is obviously if you're setting up like a first-time bow hunter or just general bow setup, is that's that's the main accomplishment is getting this arrow to shoot straight out of this. So, and it's been done long before all of this other stuff has came along. Mm-hmm. So, um, as far as sights, you know, when you're sighting in, if you're hitting, if you're hitting to the right, you want to move with whatever adjustments. There's lots of different adjustments on these sights, so it's hard to speak specifically. But essentially, you're going to want that pin. If you're hitting to the right, you want that pin to move to the right. If yeah. you're if you're hitting low, you want to actually move your pin. You want to you want to follow the arrow, follow I guess, arrow. with yep. you know with your sight there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then, then if you do have a slider, like on this bow here, you know, you can use a ballistic software, uh, to, you know, essentially enter in all your, your different variables, generate a sight tape. You're going to want to check your sight tape. Um, yeah, most manufacturers will give you like a whole bunch of them and you just set, you know, you can, there's different ways and different processes of getting it, but basically you set like a, a 20 and a 60 and then that tells you which sight tape, mm-hmm. but it's the same thing as doing a, like a custom turret strip on a, on a rifle. Mm-hmm. Um, um, uh, peep sights, we didn't, I mean, we talked about them, but there are different sizes. Um, mm-hmm. You can get really, really small ones. You can get really, really big ones. You get ones that you can put lenses in. Um, just get something that doesn't obstruct your field of view, but also isn't so big that you're struggling to get your sight housing inside the center mm-hmm. um we don't want to add another another variable we don't want to go okay peep site and then housing in the peep site and then now the pin on the animal you're just adding too many things and then it can start to get you know kind of you, you you're chasing your tail there too so try to get a peep site that's about the diameter of your of your site housing when you're at full draw mm-hmm. um and as far as uh but don't get so small that you're obstructing your view because I like a, I like a little bit. I would err on the side of larger than than smaller. And I'd say you know some of those peeps are application specific too. Sure. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like yeah. I think you're talking hunting. in terms of, yeah. of hunting. You Every, know, which that's, yeah. I mean that's what I think of all the time. You know. Yes, um, I tell that everybody in the phones too. I said you got to understand. I'm a hunter first, shooter second. So right. you know everything that I do, everything that I set up is based off hunting. You know, and doing that very well. Um, but as far as another thing that I wanted to make sure we talked about was, um, peep height. Now, most of the time I, in my, and this is one of those things where this, it's obviously there's other people are going to say, no, it needs to go this way in this, this spot, but they're going to have you at the bow shop or if you're doing yourself, you're going to draw back with your eyes closed, get an anchor point, open up your eyes. Um, with the worst part about that right away for new archers is most people don't know where that anchor point is supposed to be. Everybody's face is different. Um, but where this, where this peep sight adjusts up and down is going to affect how much you can dial up here or how far you can shoot. Now there's other things that change that as well, but it's, you'll start to see it affect you more with, um, with heavier arrows. Um, I'm seeing it with my wife's bow. Um, her, I think it's, a, I don't think that her face is super short, but it's just her, she doesn't have a straw jaw line mm-hmm. like I have. So um, I have something really hard and solid to come back on, um, and that's where it's always been is right underneath my jaw, which is a good place to have it. It's a good set point. But um, with her, um, she doesn't really have that. So she kind of just found this spot where she feels good, and that's where we're finding out that she really likes like a kisser button or like now the Bomars have the nose button. Mm-hmm. Um, she's, she I likes added one those. of those this year. So people, I think I like it. 
Yeah, gives you a point of reference. Yeah, um, for where so that draws that because that draws got to be perfect every time. It's got to be mm-hmm. the same, not perfect. It's got to be the same. Exactly. Same is different than perfect. But Consistent. You can have a terrible form, but if you do it at the same time every time, that arrow is going to go to the same place every mm-hmm. time. So keep that in mind. But as far as peep height, her peep height is lower, which is causing a limitation on how far she can shoot. Um, and I'm not saying oh she can't shoot 90 yards now. I'm saying it's like she's limited to like 50. Because, yeah. you know, it's just on her, on her dial or her set, and that's maxed all the way out where most bows, you know, you're going to be shooting like 100 yards. Um, not, I mean, the, the dial will allow you to go to those distances, right. but with a heavy arrow and a low poundage and low draw length, um, I've noticed that that is an issue to where I wish, and you can't change it now because it changes her whole form, but I wish when we first set her up that I would have paid more attention to her peep height and her draw, her uh, anchor point. You know, the anchor point is obviously you have to have a point of reference where your backhand comes to your face or touches there. And that has to be the same every time or you'll get inconsistencies. Uh, just no different than shooting a rifle. you got to come on that rifle the same every time. Otherwise, it's, you're going to get different impacts. Um, a bore, I think a bore, bow more so than a rifle just because obviously if you've done the research, the, the projectile is actually out of the, out of the rifle before the recoil is in you but it does change how your position on the gun is going to change the point of impact and on a bow um, i think that's heightened so um, we have to make sure that we're doing everything the same but i wish i would have uh, focused more on her uh, where her anchor point was at and made sure it was lower than what she is at now whatever that would be whether she has to change a knuckle or or just how she does that but that's one thing that has affected there was actually a guy it's pretty cool youtube video a long time ago um when you know dialing bow sites was was starting to get big what he did is he took and he mounted like six peep sites across from he didn't have this a prime so obviously he started like here and went all the way down and what he did is instead of dialing your bow he just changed his point of imp- or point of aim through his on the uh wild the string size side yeah and he was shooting out to like 110 yards and just di- just drilling it every time um, and it, it all that all goes down I to. I have to look that one up. Yeah, it's pretty it cool. It's so super weird. old. It's it's that was a long time ago. I remember watching that, but it was a really cool video. Um, kind of a new concept. And basically, what he was doing is just changing the rear, you know, instead of changing the the right. sight. But that would allow you not that not that I would say go and do that. Maybe someday that'll be the thing. But <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. And that video was a long long time ago. So um, no, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, if if you if you uh, if you've been listening, you've been listening to almost an hour and a half, which oh, is a, which is about a half hour longer than oh, we goodness. generally <laughs> go. But I think it just goes to show that demonstrates. And you know, we're talking about kind of both setup bakes, basics here, and it just demonstrates like the rabbit holes that you can you can get down here, and there really is. It's it's simple in some ways. You're you're kind of doing a simple thing, but it's also very complex in some ways. And yep. then it's it's um, you know, to the uh, to the user. And then there's just, there's just different uh, opinions, schools of thought. You know, Travis, we could uh, sit down and like we talked about earlier, same topic, different guest, and and you're going to come up with you know probably yep. some some different philosophies, some different ways to skin the cat. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of them are right. You know, so um, different bow shops are going to do things a little bit differently because yep. they've figured out what works, you know, the way they do it. So, but uh, hopefully you've gleaned something from this podcast. I know I always do every time we talk about it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, if you want to hear more bow setup stuff, let us know. And uh, other than that, man, uh, get your bow set up, shoot straight. Yeah. Hopefully, uh we're we're at the end of July here uh, that we're recording this, so hopefully that you're set up by now because we're getting getting it's down crunch there. time. <laughs> yeah, it's crunch time. Yep. yep. So, but yeah, thanks for listening. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Take care. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, Travis. Thanks. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.